Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's episode of Courageous Leadership Academy Live. If you're new to this channel, my name is Kelly Waltman, and I'm the, the host of this channel. And we talk about really all things leadership and helping us all be more courageous leaders, everything from finding our purpose and leading with that purpose to how to have better conversations. And today's topic, how to be an inclusive leader. I'm really, really excited about our topic today and our guest. Um, our guest today is Jennifer Brown. She is an award-winning entrepreneur, speaker, diversity and inclusion consultant, and author. Highly recommend you pick up her, her book, How to Be an Inclusive Leader. As the founder and CEO of Jennifer Brown Consulting, she is responsible for designing workplace strategies that have been implemented, implemented by some of the biggest companies and nonprofits in the world. She has harnessed more than 14 years of experience as a world-renowned diversity and inclusion expert through consulting work, keynoting and thought leadership. And it is our honor and pleasure to have her here today. And so without further ado, let's welcome Jennifer into the broadcast. Hello. Hey, hello. Welcome. Hi, welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Thank you so much. So I always like to open with the opportunity to ask, is there anything else that you would like to share in terms of an introduction personally, professionally, anything else about who you are that we should know? You know, I don't think so. I think you covered it. I live in New York City with my partner, Michelle, and you see the brownstones behind me, typical Greenwich Village, uh, and spring is springing slowly but surely, so there are some leaves on the branches we're happy to see, and yeah, just um, a really amazing and intense time to be doing this work, and I'm sure we will be talking about that. Absolutely. Yes, for sure. Mm -hmm. So, the other thing I like to do is really just start out with the basics, like, you know, define the basic components, concepts, words. So let's start with how do you define inclusion? Let's just start our conversation there. Thank you. That's uh, the, it's in both of my books titles. So I, sh <laughs> I should know the answer. Uh, so it's actually the way to define it, I think, is by starting with the definition of another word, which is often mm -hmm. conflated with it, which is diversity and inclusion. Yes. So diversity is the who. I think of it as the um, the identities around a given table, um, both visible and invisible, right? Because a lot of our diverse dimensions and identities are not perceivable. They're not visible unless we make them visible. Like my LGBTQ identity is something that's a great example of that. Um, so the who, and then inclusion is the how, so inclusion is how that diversity is gets to that table, how we are engaged once we are all there, because you can't have one without the other. You, you, if you have the diversity, but that all of those opinions and lived experiences are not meaningfully and effectively and generously included, then we miss out on the promise of the diversity. And uh, if we have the inclusive behaviors, uh, so we're really good at the how, right? We are good at the meeting dynamics and uh, welcoming, you know, feedback and input and and making sure everybody's heard, but we don't have the diversity of lived experience in that group of people. Then we miss out on the promise of that um, diversity of thought and identity and background that's so critical for really innovative solutions and outcomes. And so uh, they're very they're two sides of a coin, but inclusion fascinated me because it felt less quantified. It is kind of less quantifiable, I think. Uh, diversity typically is is much easier to measure, at least the visible parts, um, right. and at least the parts that aren't so stigmatized that nobody wants to admit to being a member of a community, which, by the way, is very rampant among LGBTQ people, people with disabilities. You will not, we will not be the ones that check the box on the employee form. We right. just won't, um, because there is such a history, I think, of being um, experiencing bias as a result of that. So we, there's not a lot of trust there sadly. Yeah. Um, so I think, um, but inclusion fascinated me because it's behavioral. It's kind of, you know, when you see it, you hear it, or you feel it when you feel it. And so nailing that down and thinking about, so how do we know we are inclusive? According to whom, too? Because I think the other interesting thing is there's a subjective, you know, estimation of, of how I am as a leader. Right. But then there's the 360 degree feedback style of, well, this is how I experience you showing up. And those sometimes there is a big gap between those two things. Right. Sometimes we're actually better than we think we are. And but many of us are not as effective as we would like to think we are. So that's where feedback becomes really important. Yeah. And that's 
first of all, wow, there was, <laughs> it was oh, no, sorry. <laughs> no, that was, <laughs> no, that was amazing. Um, you know, from defining both the diversity and inclusion piece and, and how they, they need to work in tandem. Um, I absolutely loved everything about that. Um, but then you're right with the feedback piece. And that's something that, that we talk about on this channel a lot. And I talk a lot about in the work I do is, is getting comfortable with feedback and being an actively receiving and giving feedback. And that is such a, a key piece because we can think that we're being inclusive and we can think that we are doing these things or like, as you said, maybe we're better than we think we are. We have some things that we're doing really well and we don't know, you know, to continue doing those things um, without that feedback loop, we're really not going to have an accurate sense um, of, of really what the dynamic is and how included people feel. That's so, right. That's, yeah. and, and we tend to give ourselves pats on the back. I think the thing that's really changed in the last year, but this has been changing for a while, but especially in the last year, it's the, we, we've, I think we all need to step forward and do more and get comfortable being uncomfortable. Um, in the old days, it used to be, oh, Pride Month's coming. Like, let me put my pin on or like, let me attend an event, you know? So, and I think the bar has changed um, and not to throw any of that stuff under the bus because some people, that's a huge step for some people to even be able to, to engage, to say, I want to be an ally to this community is a big step. But I think the bar is moving beyond what we call performative allyship and the bar is moving not just for us as humans and individuals but for companies too mm -hmm. which is really exciting so you're seeing in the news just this week around voting rights and companies moving into this conversation that they've never been in before right and they've been kind of stiff you know sticking a toe into social issues um whether it's like the trans like bathroom bills in north carolina and the athletic teams pulling their their um tournaments out of the state you know, refusing to do business with the state with hostile bathroom bills that are anti-trans. So um, it's been happening, but maybe sort of behind the scenes and not in the numbers we're seeing. So the beyond the performative means that we don't just write a check to, you know, a cause and sort of consider it done, or we don't just post the black square for Black Lives Matter. But the question now is really, you know, what are we doing to examine our systems, to address our representation issues, to have our employees back in the larger social conversation? And that is like a whole different level. I mean, I have been channeling this <laughs> for a very long time. And a right. lot of us, are, you know, because we know the might of organizations. I mean, it, there is no, no question that a bunch of committed citizens can accomplish a lot. Excellent. But boy, when those companies weigh in and say, you know what, this issue impacts our employees. This issue impacts our ability to generate, to be a safe space for us to bring our full selves to work because we know that all these external issues are impacting our employees. Every mm -hmm. single day we bring this into work with us, even virtually. And to ask our employees to deny how the, what's going on is impacting us is literally like sweeping diversity issues under the rug and we're not willing to do it anymore. And that, so that's what's happening. It's really exciting. Yeah. Yeah. It has been amazing to see this transformation of dialogue um, over the last handful of years and in a lot of really good and encouraging ways. And then in some maybe discouraging yeah. ways. <laughs> to, <laughs> yes. There are those. You know, the the you know, Yes. <laughs> but yeah. On, on the positive note, it has been, um, encouraging and exciting and challenging and, you know, invigorating to see how this dialogue is coming to the forefront. Um, and, you know, I love that, you know, there's, there's people like you doing this work to, um, you know, educate all of us, um, and, and help us be, help us be better. <laughs> Trying. Yes. Trying. Some days I get really exhausted and, you know, yeah. this week, this week has been a hard one, um, watching the news and feeling the impact and, just um, put, continuing to push. And right. if I could sort of leave everything with one thing, it would be to have this a deep understanding and empathy for what these moments right now that we're living through as a society, how they feel and how they're being experienced and the pain and the trauma and the and the need for support and solidarity has never been greater. So, you know, I feel very called as an aspiring ally, as, as an aspiring, what I might say, a co-conspirator which is a, is a term I prefer because it sort of implies like I'm in the water with you. Like right. 
I'm driving the getaway car, you know, and the engine's right. going and I'm, I'm ready. You know, I want right. to just be deployed. Tell me right. like what really will make a difference. Um, and, and funny, like checking my own assumption about what the solution looks like. Right. But ask, always asking, you know, what does support look like? What is needed in this moment? And, and, and sort of really having like a hyper focus on that, I think is another piece of our learning, which is to say like, um, who is driving the solution is so important and to sort of take ourselves out of that position and be in a support role yeah. and, and use our platform or use whatever we have access to, to, to um, get the word out, to educate others, to lend voice to something, but being driven, having all that be driven by those who are really most impacted by what's going on. I love what you said about be a co-conspirator. And mm. because, you know, when you think about an ally, when you put it that way, I, I get this image of the ally as the person who's maybe standing on the sidelines, just cheering you on, you know, yeah. like, <laughs> you, go, you know, I'm just, you, I'm, I'm, you know, but yeah, co-conspirator, like you said, you're, you're in it together. Um, and so I love that the visual that comes to mind when you just in that shift in terminology, I think that that's, that's great, you know, being in it together rather than just kind of standing on the sidelines and cheering somebody on. Exactly. Um, yeah, that's great. So in thinking about, um, you know, leadership, what, and again, maybe doing some, some definition work here, what does being an inclusive leader mean to you? Like when you, when you talk about that and that's, you know, the title of one of your books, mm -hmm. you know, what does that mean to be an inclusive leader? Well, the first thing I'd say is it's a destination, mm -hmm. um, but it's not reached. And the point is not to complete the activity because it's never complete. It's right. a journey. It's a journey and it's a moniker or a label or a name or a designation that I think is is earned. Um, and it's earned and estimated by those around us. Right. Um, because I think we are very poor or inaccurate judges of our own behavior, our own impact versus our intent. So that classic, I'm sure you've talked about intent versus impact. It's a classic right. coaching tool and sort of leadership rubric, but it's um, it's so relevant to inclusive leadership. Uh, is um, I can want something, I can intend it, I can mean it, I can be passionate about it. Uh, but really what matters is what was received. Right. And then coming back as messenger and saying, what do, well, now what have I learned about that? And how can I then modify my approach and incrementally improve my, my competency, my efficacy? Um, and so I think inclusive leaders are extremely curious about where we where we are as leaders. You know, where are we as humans in the in the book? I have a four stage model, which is unaware, aware, active and advocate. So there's four phases. And if we're an unaware, at least we know the tool is meant to give folks a sense of where am I in this journey? Because I think, honestly, so much of the confusion and inaction is about not really understanding what does the path look like and what are the signposts along the path and so i really endeavored to create a model that was very simple that made intuitive sense um, and that really really took the the shame out of it because i i don't think this should be a shame-based process necessarily right. i think we need to feel urgency mm -hmm. and we need to understand this is an emergency right and if it's not an emergency for us it is an emergency for others, and that is where I think privilege comes into play, which means that if this moment is not an emergency for you, then that is a huge aha moment for us about, some of us about how parts of our identity shield us right. from police brutality. So yeah, it that's so good. <laughs> us. Like, I, I, I mean, I'm an LGBTQ person, right. but I, I have been shielded by the other parts of my identity right. so that when I came out, I did not at all experience the fear, the la the safety issues, the um, banishment from employment, the um, intense bias that I could have faced if I were also a woman of color, if I were also a trans woman, if I were a trans woman of color. So understanding these things is, is I think, elemental to sort of deconstructing the Rubik's cube, if you will, of, of our identity. Like you turn Jennifer this way and you can see this. If you turn it this way, you can see this. If she trusts you enough to show you, you'll see <laughs> this cube, you know? Right. Uh, and, and that's, I think, that psychological safety that inclusive leaders are constantly thinking about. How can I build um, an environment around me where 
we can trust each other and people will trust me with their most true and vulnerable um, identities and diversity dimensions. Um, right. And that to me is the measure of, a, of an inclusive leader. And, and honestly, bigger than inclusion, this is leadership in general is really right. changing. We're, we're being challenged. No joke. Like it doesn't, for a lot of people, I think it feels like all the things I used to do somehow don't feel right. Right. Um, because of the pandemic, because of what I'm hearing and what I'm observing about how distracted we are, how much loss and grief we're all processing. Uh, yes, how police brutality and things in the news are, 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 are impacting our families and our loved ones directly. So I think that leadership in a time like this is, is by nature needing to be empathetic and vulnerable and transparent and imperfect because it's imperfect because we don't have a script. We haven't done this before, a lot of us. Uh, and so that inclusive leader realizes that I'm gonna have to learn and apply imperfectly, that I'm doing many things for the first time, that I am uh, uh, comfortable being uncomfortable and expecting to be uncomfortable and actually seeking out discomfort. I would say, if you are not uncomfortable on a regular basis, you are not leading. Right. And in, particularly in these times, if you're comfortable, I have some questions. <laughs> I totally agree. Yes, I love that. I totally agree. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, I think, you know, when you mentioned earlier and, and similar thread just now that, you know, it's it's naive of us to think that what's happening outside of work isn't going to impact our work selves. And, you know, there are obviously many uh, trauma inducing things that have come from this pandemic. But one of the things that I think, as you said, leadership, hopefully they've adapted, they needed to adapt. But I think there has been this awareness of this forced awareness that we can't just compartmentalize ourselves. So we can't just compartmentalize our, our lives. And people sometimes are forced to do so, but not really. I mean, we can try, but we're not really going to be able to do that. And I think there's been this greater awareness of that because our whole selves have been a part of those that have had to work remotely, and that's affected everybody on up. You know, this wasn't something that just affected the line worker. This affected everybody all the way up through the C-suite. There's been this kind of forced recognition that we are a whole self and that we need to be able to bring our whole self to work. Um, and I'm not saying that that has happened for everybody. I'm not. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I think that it it has helped with the awareness of that and, and some of the dialogue. Does that oh, make yeah. sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. you took the words right out of my mouth. I say that all the time. the the forced, the forced transparency, and it's right. ironic because we so we're not in the physical workplace anymore, which we would have thought would force more transparency. But actually, there was a lot of opportunity to hide things in the in the yeah. old workplace, and then in the virtual workplace, our lives are unfolding behind us. Our families, our same sex partner, right, which we were closeted about. Our you know, the chaos of our parenting and now we're homeschooling too. And, you know, where our performance goes down because, you know, we can't manage a lot of this. And that makes a lot of sense that we can't manage it because it's unmanageable. Right. <laughs> um, but, you know, interestingly, you know, I have friends who have flourished in behind this virtual screen with each other, meaning um, I, I'm sure I'm not the only one that feels I have kind of deepened my relationships with my all virtual team um, because we have been more forthright and, and and trusted each other with what's going on. Yes, because we didn't have a choice because it was unfolding. Like if I need a mental health day, maybe you can see it on my face. Maybe I don't have my video on. Maybe, you know, I'm, I'm just, my struggle is clear. And uh, whether I have wanted to or not, I feel like it's kind of a pushing out of the nest mm -hmm. process because we, we were forced to be real with each other. And therefore though, it has generated, I think, I, I hope. Now this is very, I'm gonna say this, and I know this is not true across the board. And actually there's some very disturbing statistics that are we've been looking at around harassment and, and, and discrimination in the virtual workplace uh, for lots of reasons. And I know that's not our topic, but just to focus though on the depth that we have achieved through this crisis and often because of crises, we innovate. Right. Um, and we we take a quantum leap forward. And I think the quantum leap forward in inclusion we've we have made is that we what like it or not, whether we were ready or not, we had to say, this is my life, this is who I am, and this is the support I need. 
Um, right. Otherwise, I'm just going to give up and I'm going to quit. And by the way, millions of women quit last yeah. year yeah. and probably continue to. I don't know the stats for 2021, but because we didn't because we didn't have appropriate support and sort of infrastructure, and we've been saying this for years, but it's been falling on, you know, um, hard ground uh, yeah. to say, I need flex work arrangements. We need better parental leave policies. I have to know I'm not going to get derailed from my career trajectory when I take time off and I'm able to return to the assignments and to the clients and, you know, or pay equity. Like we have to gro gross up pay and fix our pay gap once and for all and never let it happen again. I mean, all these things add up. And, and sort of pushed women over the edge and out of the workplace, you know, right. undoing years of progress. So mm -hmm. we really are so overdue for the real conversation about things like mental health as well, which has always been with us and always in our workforce, but something we, was deeply stigmatized, nobody wanted to talk about. And we therefore, I think we didn't understand the pervasiveness of it, the variety of ways that it shows up, why, you know, episodic, chronic, mm -hmm. you know, and then the fact that most people would, if you ask them, would say, I have no idea if a company supports this, you know, right. or as a manager to say, what would you say if you sense your employees or they come to you that they're experiencing or a loved one is experiencing a mental health crisis, what do you do next? And, and just the sheer lack of understanding because it's been so stigmatized is, um, is, is heartbreaking. And, um, I think we also lose a whole lot of people due to that when we shouldn't, and we and we can't afford to. Right. We can't afford to. So, uh, yeah. So I think we're you're right that we're in a reckoning. We've got what we got to do is keep that door propped open. I always had this image of like sticking my foot in the door that's opened and not letting it close, because what it's going to want to do is going to want to close back up. It's just going to we're going to want to go back to safety. We're going to want to go back to hiding. But what's happened is ensuring our stories and being truthful, we are forcing a conversation with our employers to be better. And I think right now there is a receptivity to that that I've never seen, which is we want to be better. And right. please tell us how we can be better. Um, I think there is, there is a, a different, the tone of that conversation is really different now. And um, I think people really are looking for answers um, and where they can put their energy. And like we talked about going beyond performative allyship. Right. What can we do? Let me ask our community, what would be most meaningful for us to do? Let me not make assumptions that I know the answers because I often do not. People that look like me should not be the ones coming up with the answers right. for how to address what's going on um, this week, for example. Right. Yeah. Anyway, so so I think we're getting there. It's slow and it's slower than I would like, but at least we have some the wind at our backs for change right now in a way that um, I think is really unusual. Yeah. Yeah, I completely agree. You know, one of the things that um, I keep thinking about through the, as a, a thread through this conversation is, you know, the, the concept of psychological safety yeah. and how important it is. And that was true pre-pandemic and it mm -hmm. continues to be true now. Um, you know, talk about how inclusion ties to psychological safety, the importance of inclusion with having a, a workplace culture that that um, promotes psych psychological safety. Can you talk a bit about that? Yeah, it's um, the topic, the term has really become very central to yeah. DEI world. I mean, I think, you, as you said, it's always been a consideration, but I think I'm um, particular to different identities feeling seen and heard and valued in the workplace. I think if we do a good job of like going back to our definitions at the top of the call, the inviting the diversity to the table, all kinds of diversity, uh, and then inviting the contributions, there has to be, and practicing inclusive behaviors is a way of generating psychological safety, is a way, I think it's very tied to belonging. I think psychological safety happens when I trust others with all of who I am, and we say, bring your full self to work. Right. It's an, it's an acknowledgement that that is much harder for some of us to do and much more risky for some of us to do. So those leaders and colleagues who understand that, like when I come into a space and I'm with colleagues, I have to be thinking. So who, who, who feels relatively more or less confident, you know, in this moment to give that idea, to interrupt, to share, to back somebody up. Um, 
And then who's feeling sort of overly confident because, you know, the world has been some of our oyster for a really long time. Yeah. <laughs> so how, and then if I'm in that room, how do I rebalance that constantly? And that's the work of an inclusive leader to notice, to come into it with the knowledge, right? Having done our homework about who is the voiceless traditionally and why, and then how can I true that up? How can I sort of do this with my leadership behaviors, with the way that I manage manage for inclusion around me, um, invite people to speak, interrupt, correct, um, make sure airtime is shared, you know, more equally, follow up, you know, there, there's so many behaviors I can do. But um, I think in doing this, psychological safety is generated. Mm -hmm. And that safety then, I think teams will do more and give more if I feel safe. Safety is enormous. I mean, imagine trying to be creative and give input or bring your best ideas when you're not feeling safe, it's right. like impossible because your safety is your primal self, which is like, am I safe here? I mean, this is like a, a very deep question and a very distracting question, I think, to be worried about while we are trying to create and be present and you know be in flow that we need to be in our jobs and our professional lives, um, present to each other, present to ourselves. So it, if we don't feel it, I fear that um, our ideas are compromised, our um, our brilliance can't really come through right. unless we're comfortable. So right. in generating psychological safety and really prioritizing that, you know, not just as leaders with direct reports, but this can be done uh, laterally, it can be done bottom up, you know, managing up. You can create psychological safety for anyone in a sort of 360 degree way by um, inviting conversations, by being vulnerable, by sharing our story and sort of getting comfortable being uncomfortable, um, by creating a space for a dialogue, by um, being extremely you know, curious and open and, and seeking to, to improve, by admitting what we don't know uh, and saying, I don't have the answers and I'm learning. So, so I try to give leaders like literally sort of the things to say. I'm like, I'm like, I, you should be writing this down right now because this may be stuff that's not comfortable for you to say that you've never heard yourself say before. But right. these are the ingredients of belonging, which is which is all the things that I just said. Um, no, not sweeping difference under the rug, not you know invalidating somebody's lived experience, but but welcoming that, expecting it, and acknowledging it. Not doubting it, not questioning it. If somebody tells you what it feels like to be LGBTQ plus in an organization, you can believe them the first time. It is not, it's not a debate. It's not something that you, I hate to say this, it sounds really harsh, but like you don't get to have an opinion. <laughs> right. your, your opinion can be, well, that's not right. And, you know, I, I'm going to be that co-conspirator. I'm going to figure out right. like what solidarity really looks like, but it's never it's never about like, I don't believe that happens. I don't right. believe it's that bad. I'm not, I, that couldn't possibly be true because I don't have biases. Right. That couldn't possibly be true here because we have tons of fill in the blank here mm -hmm. in our workplace. So people love it here or whatever. Like there's so many things we are, we see through our own lens of comfort right. that are completely not true for others. And if we could just like increase people's awareness and vigilance to that. Um, and then uh, I think we'd be further along, but it, it's a hard one. It, 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 surpri it surprises me how hard it is for people to kind of say, to lower all of those defenses and all of those kind of obstructive techniques and then and then begin to show up in a different way with different language or different energy. Um, it, it's just baked into us. And so right. this, this is a big change. You know, it reminds me when I talk with people about how to receive feedback effectively, I say uh -huh. the first, the key thing is resist the urge to respond immediately. Yes. Resist the urge to respond with, well, that's not what I meant, or you don't understand. You know, our, our knee jerk response, it's like ingrained in us is to, to justify, explain, or defend. And so when you're saying that, it reminds me so much of that. It's like receiving that critical feedback. If we're hearing somebody else's story, that we just can't see, like, even if we weren't the ones to do it, you mm -hmm. know, to have the, just hearing that, I think we just, yeah, it's, a, it's almost like we have this instinct, this need. And so if we can all just resist that urge 
to respond that way and just listen and just hear and let people be heard. Um, I think that, yeah, that would go such a, a long, long way. Um, and it mm. it is interesting, I think. So I had so many thoughts as, as you were chatting. It's so good. Um, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. I think on one hand, it's hard for people in a space of privilege because we don't have to think about do I feel comfortable here? Because maybe we already feel comfortable. We've never had to think about it. So it's hard to think that other people are coming into that room feeling that way and having to evaluate their comfort, having to evaluate how much of themselves they can bring because we've always been able to just bring our whole self. So we don't even have to think about that. Um, and so part of it, I think is, that's why I love when you, you talked about the awareness and just in educating, it's helping people see that there are people that every time they walk into a space, they have to evaluate for comfort, for safety, for risk, like everything, every time they wanna share an idea, they're evaluating the risk of sharing that idea. And I think for people who haven't had to do that, first of all, they should find themselves in a position where they have to do that. Put yourself mm -hmm. in some, like be the minority in some capacity, <laughs> like, you know, have that experience, but then also being aware of it, um, but yeah, I think also there is this tendency to become defensive. Mm. I've, I've seen that, you know, that like you said, well, oh, well, that can't happen here. We have X, Y, and Z or, yeah. oh, we have. And so it's almost this need to defend rather than just letting somebody share their story. Um, and so, mm. yeah, I love, I love, as you were describing that, those are just some of the, the things that. That's all so good. You really get it. You really, yeah. you really yeah. You're picking up on all the right things. I can tell yeah. this is not your first rodeo. Um, <laughs> no, it's uh, yeah. learning too. You know, it's like I you said, so. it's it's the it's the never ending story. You know, it's the never ending <laughs> journey um, of of learning and and growth for sure. It's it just you know, and I think this comes through studying and listening to other lived experiences and putting right. yourself, like you just said, in in the minutia, know what it feels like to be the only yes. in situations and feel uncomfortable. Yes. And, and not understand what people are talking about and not understand language or be confused about, wait a second, the community calls that uses this word and that word, and that seems to be changing. These are all the things that I think we should, we have to become students of because we, we will, we will be leading and we are leading across difference all the time. Right. Um, and so sensitizing ourselves like pronouns, like my pronouns are she, mm -hmm. her, hers. I really try to remind myself to share them. Right. And then often I will pause and I'll say, I want to explain why I did that and, and what 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 is the significance of pronouns right. and how for me to share my pronouns as a cisgender woman is a less risky thing for me to do because my group is relatively more safe. Right. Um, and then being sensitized to the fact that there may be so many people hiding of different gender identities that really want you to call them a different pronoun or a different name who may be on your team who may be in your family, in your community, in your church community, in your schools, and, and knowing that the presumption that the, the identities we walk through the world with are the dominant identities mm -hmm. is this piece that we have to really, really check ourselves from. Um, but I, I find that once you start to do, it, it becomes a habit. And now, and I know I'm sure I still stumble into not doing it well, but I do, I have developed it and it is developable. It is within our reach. And I always try to, I try to like inspire people that this is, this is manageable. Like you can, you won't always feel so awkward. It right. will, it will start to become something that is part of your leadership toolkit and your muscle. And it, and, and you will not have all the answers. And I think the important thing to say is I don't have all the answers. Here's what I'm endeavoring to learn. And here's, a mistake I made and here's what I learned. Or here's something I'm going to be trying and endeavoring to do, probably poorly executed. So, right. you know, I would not just welcome feedback, which is I think very passive. Um, and many people won't gather up the courage to right. knock on the door in the old in the old school way or get on your calendar and with Zoom right. <laughs> to say, you know, something you just you said in the meeting, I appreciated your intent. Here was your impact. Here's right. what I think you're trying to do and here's what I might recommend. Um, but those beautiful call-in conversations I really love versus the call out. Mm -hmm. If we can avoid the call out, the call out is sort of the public mm -hmm. identification of a mistake and harm. Um, it's necessary, 
it is certainly necessary. Um, when things aren't moving, a call out is sometimes needed. We have to up the ante. It is bad behavior. It needs to be publicly addressed. Right. But in the workplace, I think calling in is, is I think, more conducive to inviting change minus the shaming. Right. So, and I think if we think, if we put ourselves on the other end, when we want to, we want to call out, when you put yourself on the other end and say like, wow, like people called me in over the course of my learning. Right. And I appreciated that because it, it meant that I could learn in private and improve in public. Mm -hmm. uh, and that it allowed me to really receive the feedback and adjust. And, um, you know, like any learning process, learning it and applying it and learning it and applying it, which is so like necessary. But if we make learning itself a terrifying endeavor, because we fear judgment and sort of a zero sum game or a binary right and wrong interpretation of what we're trying to do, um, that is that doesn't speak to the the messiness of learning. You know, I love Carol Dweck's work, uh, yes. growth mindset, right? And like failing forward, we have to create space for each other to fail forward and have the space and grace to say, "I see you. I see you trying." You know, I appreciate that it's making a difference. And, you know, here's what I might add and, and coaching. And um, boy, I really appreciate the, the way feedback is given to me is, is it matters. It really matters so much. And it can be done beautifully and you can respond beautifully. Yes. Um, so we have choices in these, in these equations. And I think, but we just have to be cautious. Just remember, like who who held space for you to get better and more knowledgeable about something and right. how was that done? And what would you like done for you and alongside you as you learn and then replicate that? Because I think that inevitably then that is done with kindness. Yeah. Yeah. I appreciate what you were saying about with feedback that it's, it's passive. Often people will passively say, Oh, well, I welcome your feedback. <laughs> but they can't really do anything to 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 facilitate that dialogue. You know, you need to be intentional about cultivating the space for that dialogue to actually happen. And um, you know, I encourage people to to have to set time and space in a safe way to to actively request that feedback and ask questions like, "What are you getting from me that's helpful? What aren't you getting from me that would be helpful? Oh, great what question. could I do? You know, what could I do to help you be more successful? You know, to ask those types of questions because, you know, people will likely feel like, okay, I can answer that. That's a non-threatening way for me to give you some feedback. You know, they're kind of like those gateway questions to, to start. <laughs> the yeah, so, um, so, in thinking about ways that leaders, you know, maybe they maybe they're further along in their journey, uh, maybe they're just starting out. And they want to start to have those conversations with their team members or maybe even colleagues. It doesn't necessarily have to be a leader, but wow. they want to start to have those conversations. What are some ways that they can open that dialogue in a respectful and safe way without burdening the person to like be their educator? Like, wow. okay, now you're my, you're my personal <laughs> educator on this journey. Like, how can we strike that balance of wanting to to open the dialogue, but also be respectful of the space that, that that person might need. Yeah, well, you're right. We have to be very careful about the emotional labor that we ask others to do in educating us. And you just said that, and I want to underscore it. Um, but what I appreciate as an LGBTQ person is I can kind of discern if somebody's been doing their homework. Um, based on what they share with me about what they've been attending, what they've been listening to, what they're reading, what they're watching, what they're reflecting on. Um, and so if they come to me and say, tell me about the LGBTQ plus experience, Jennifer, you know, I will answer a question with a question and I'll say, well, tell me, tell me why you're interested. Tell me what you, right. what you're learning. Um, tell me what you're specifically, could you tell me a little bit more about like what your journey has been on this? Right. And that is my moment to discern, am I gonna have to do a lot of emotional labor for this person and really like explain things that are on the Google? <laughs> like, <laughs> come on. <laughs> Can I tell Here's you your homework. You come back to me. <laughs> <laughs> come back to me in a month. <laughs> so I think that preparation piece is is one of the ways we can really show respect. It's respect for people's time and their labor. And they gotta know that those of us in marginalized communities are in it is hard enough just to be showing up every day. Right. 
So to ask more is something that is really unfair and um, it's just not the right time, right. especially these days. So I think, um, and, okay, so if that is true and we have to really, really pick our spots for those conversations, but, and our preparation then means, I think that we take advantage of being the fly on the wall of different, you know, in the companies I work with, there's a lot of things called affinity groups. And some of the listeners may know what I'm talking about, but if you work for a company these days of any size, my goodness, I've seen affinity groups, which are called employee resource groups or business resource groups. They are diverse identity groups, meaning the women's network, the LGBTQ network, the black employee network, the employees with disabilities network. Those are networks that are meeting on a constant basis and, and supporting each other and, and having kind of that community dialogue about how our identity is experienced by us in the workplace. And so those microaggressions and those um, challenges with career progression and mentoring and sponsorship and all the things that um, get in our way when we are underrepresented in the workplace. And so these, these discussions and the community support is so critical. But these days, these groups and discussions are open to everyone. Mm. And so I, I know for me and my learning, I, I, in addition to consuming media that's not made by and for people that look like me, which is one of my homework tasks for myself, I also surround myself. I listen literally to podcasts about different identities that aren't even, the podcast is not even for me, really. Right. right. Um, it's not meant to sort of sanitize somebody's experience and make Jennifer comfortable. It's not the point of the podcast, right? I I want to hear what's going on because that's how I learn and have compassion and empathy, and um, and and it sort of um, enables me to discover new things to read and new things to watch, and so it deepens and broadens my own library, if you will, too. But um, but I think listening to dialogue and then um, being a fly on the wall having no agenda, but to just be there. And also to show your support being there is really important. In the old days, um, when I worked with executives who who are supporting these groups and wanting to accelerate, I'd say, you know, show you should be showing up to everything and just be in the back of the room, you know, and just be there, be listening. And, and that indication that this is important, that this matters symbolically is really important. But then of course the learning and the listening and and the making connections and, and and instigating relationships across difference is then something also that should come from some of these, what I'm recommending, which is, you know, is there an opportunity to be in a mutual mentoring relationship with someone across difference? I mean, I challenge leaders also to like, look at your inner circle, think about who you make time for. Do they all look like you? Do they all go to the same school? Do they all have the same, you know, educational background you did? Um, are their, are their identities different, visible and invisible? And I, if I were rating leaders on it, I would ask to see their calendar. I would ask to see who they make time to mentor. And I would say, you know, what are you attending on a day-to-day -day basis where you are the only, where you are a part of an unfamiliar conversation, where you are um, in a one-on-one -on -one dialogue with someone? And I love the mutual mentoring because I also really don't want to assume that that any knowledge worth sharing lives with the more senior person. Right. Yeah. I, I just, I'm not here for that. Like agreed. Yeah. And I think how do we define knowledge yeah. to me, the knowledge about the diversification of our world, right? Our future customers, our future consumers, what kind of products we should be building that and, and who are we recruiting and what do they, how do they identify that knowledge lives in the bottom of right. that hierarchy and the least knowledge about that lives in the top and so i really like even reverse mentoring i really like thinking about how we can position um, emerging leaders and emerging talent in our organization and earlier in career talent in the driver's seat because we must understand better than we do how to speak to people how what vocabulary to use how they see the world what they value one of the hugest missed opportunities is the fact that Younger generations are coming into the workplace and saying, what is going on here? Why do I have to go to mandatory diversity training? You know, I have friends from all over the world, you know, um, think about it. They grew up in the online world and not to say like there is no bias and there are no problems, but inclusiveness and belonging are incredibly important 
especially right. for Generation Z. I mean, who the oldest of whom are 25. So, so my older leaders of my generation, which is Gen X, like we have a lot of catching up to do. And to me, it is a crisis, even though many people are sort of comfortably asleep. It is a crisis of belonging in workplaces. And if we can't figure out how to change a broken system to work for more kinds of people, we are not gonna be innovative. We're not gonna come out with the best products. We're not gonna be able to listen to our customers. We're not gonna be a place where people come and stay and build right. a career. Right. Uh, and we can't afford to have any of that happen. So I just hope it's a wake up call for people you know, that are very comfortable. I think they are asleep. And you know, I, I think the question is, do you wanna be a viable, successful leader who is evolved enough to, to sort of make it to this next evolution? Like, are you going to thrive in that evolution? Right. I, I love that you, you know, mentioned that piece of things. I, I say a similar thing when talking about communication and, and, um, and feedback culture within a company and agency. I say, you should want to have open and effective communication and dialogue because it's the right thing to do. And that's the right way that you should work with your people. But if for no other reason than if you really want to be successful, that's how you're going to get there. And so um, for sure, we should want to have a diverse workforce and have everyone feel included and have that sense of belonging because it's the right thing to do as humans. But hmm. if you want, to, if you're in a business and you want to have a successful business, that's also how you, like you said, how you innovate, how you remain competitive. Um, so even if the human side of things isn't your main motivating factor, which it should be, but even if it's not, being aware of how essential all of this is to truly being successful as a business owner, as a corporation is, I think, a great way to also help educate, yeah. <laughs> educate people. <laughs> it's a great way around around the resistance. Yes. You yeah. know, I, I think I always yeah. think we have to have so many tools in our arsenal and the moral argument, uh, sadly, is not going to be the winning strategy. Right. I wish it were. I wish it were enough to consider like the human experience of people right. to, I mean, how painful is it not to bring your full self to work? How painful mm -hmm. is it to, to feel diminished because people are, are unaware of their biases and, and right. putting you in a box every single day with microaggressions and just completely cluelessness um, and causing harm, you know, and having no ownership of that, let alone awareness of it. But the business case, as you just described, and I just said, is is um, a really great tool, and uh, I find that it works. <laughs> I also love. I have all kinds of things. Like I like to, I like to, to appeal to people's competitive spirit mm, and say, yeah. "Well, you know, like that 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 all of our competitors, like here's what they're doing, and here's what they're doing, here's what their CEO is saying, and here's how they're, you know, what their representation numbers look like." And for anybody to feel behind is nice and motivating. Right. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, so, but I think I think the more creative we can get around what's going to unlock this for this person, for this team. And unfortunately, we have to go kind of person by person because teams are people, organizations are people, and everybody's on this different place. Uh, so I would speak to people very differently, I think, depending if I knew kind of where they were in the journey, I would present the right next step for that person, right? I wouldn't overwhelm them with, oh, here, by the way, are 60 gender identities. <laughs> I expect you to memorize all of them and come back to me tomorrow with questions. <laughs> I'm not gonna start there. <laughs> so I, I I think it's, you know, I don't know. Some people are, are really strident about this work and are like, no, I'm like having the conversation I wanna have and you'll either like it or you won't. And like, that's not my business. I am a change consultant. Like I, before I ever knew DNI was a thing, my my master's is in organizational change and leadership and learning and development. So I always think about where is somebody at. My job, I think, is to meet that and push, right. and not create unnecessary resistance or fear, shame self-doubt, mm. but to create enough cognitive dissonance and I hope heart dissonance that I can, I, can, I can generate or be part of generating an awakening. And then I can be part of generating curiosity. And then I can be part of generating tools and language and strategies. And I can also acknowledge the difficulty of change. Right. Um, none of us likes to be set to have it to hear that 
we made a mistake or we hurt somebody. Right. I hate it. I hate it. Yeah, I hate it so much, especially because my intent is so strong. Right. Um, it's hard. I go into a big, what we call a shame spiral. <laughs> um, I go to a very dark place right? Uh, and just beat myself up or think about, I have, you know, I'm horrible at that. I mean, these things, right. this internal dialogue about, I am never going to understand this. I'm never going to be good at this. I'm, it's never going to feel um, natural. Right. You know, and I, I just, I just think that's, um, just pay attention to the emotions that are surrounding this learning for you and, and know that they're real. There's a whole range of them. What's important is we, we see emotions, we don't get stuck in them, mm -hmm. but we see the important learning that they have for us because they're information, just like everything else. Um, and then I'd say sort of what's on the other side of this? Like, what do I need to take? And what does, what do I not need to take forward? Right. And I think that's been really helpful for me because if I pull all the shame of past, I didn't know, I didn't do, I'm a bad person forward. It's a, that's a lot, There's you know, and that, I think that's a hard place to learn from because, and at the end of the day, we've got to feel that we can do this. Like we've got to right. feel like this is something I can master. Ma um, I don't like the word master. This is something that I can develop competency in, right. um, you know? So I, I want to give everybody that too, because it's a, um, it can be very easy to get stuck in what I might quote Robin DiAngelo's book on white fragility. It's, it's fragility. Fragility is in a nutshell, in my, my interpretation and experience of it, it is, you know, I'm, I'm feeling, I'm making it all about me, some difficult information that I'm hearing about me or about people that identify as I do. And I'm sort of going into this spiral and I'm, I've all, I've all of a sudden sort of tuned out, really what I needed to hear and learn because I, my ego is threatened. Um, I feel accused or attacked. And um, so let's just, let's just watch that because it's, um, and trust me, I, this is advice I have to give myself every day. I, I pray for resilience. Every moment of every day, I pray for my ego not to get involved and to bend like bamboo <laughs> and just, you know, like, that, yeah, you know, take it easy, like take it mm -hmm. easily. And don't, we need everybody to stay in the arena. We don't want folks to leave. We don't want to sort of say, I'm horrible. I'm a bad person. I made, you know, I made, I'm called out. I'm canceled. I'm never going to come back. I mean, that is like the problem. I think right. that the way we're handling mistakes is that I really want to see how, what that person comes back with. Right. I want to see how they change. Like that is so important. Because um, that's the inclusion, right? You know, right. If yeah, where where if we label ourselves as yeah we're bad or we're like we're called out we're canceled and then completely excluded. Well, then that's not inclusion either. And so, <laughs> right. So yeah. So learning and growing and as you said, bending and feeling the feelings, but not just getting stuck there. And it's a messy human experience. Oh, yeah. And, yeah. Super messy, especially if you grow grew up with certain identities where. I don't yeah. think you you had that resilience. I, I think that's a big piece of it is fragility right. is white because it's white. Like right. the, the level of protection yeah. and the level of shielding that many of us have gone through life with. I, I think of it as headwinds and tailwinds, you know, the, the, the degree of that tailwind invisibly behind you right. is, is substantial. So you start to notice this and do not take it for granted. It comes with, to me, it comes with a sacred responsibility and opportunity, which is to say, if I had that tailwind and I still do, how am I kind of mitigating the headwinds that are being experienced by others using what's easier for me, using what's more comfortable and safe for me? Like that is what our charge is. And um, it's, it's amazing to be able to say that and be an LGBTQ woman and know that there are headwinds related to that. And then there's tailwinds related to other parts of who I am. And right. that all of that can be true. It is right. true. Right, it's, right. We hold all of that. And yeah. so it, to me, it's just more like, so I'm th this in this moment, this is what I'm feeling. This is the support I need. In right. this moment, here's the support somebody else needs. Right. Let me do that. That's yeah. it. This is not complicated. It doesn't have to be like overwrought and highly emotional. And like, you know, it doesn't have to be like the big gesture or whatever. I think it can be a lot of small things that really make a difference. Yeah, I, I that's a great way to describe it too. this, you know, the, the complexity of the experience is 
that yes, as a cisgender, heterosexual, white woman, you know, I, there are absolutely advantages and, and privilege that I've experienced. I've also worked in very male dominated environments through a lot of my career. And I've felt the experience of being often the only woman or one of the only women and have had, yes, pay equity issues. And, and so I, I can experience both those things can be true for me, like you said, and I can exactly. appreciate um, that other people have had more obstacles. And so I can, I can recognize my privilege, recognize also, like as you said, those headwinds um, mm -hmm. and continue to cultivate and grow and learn. And um, I don't know, try to, to be that co-conspirator for, <laughs> for others. Exactly. Around, um, that that all can be true at the same time. And I can be a co-conspirator or an ally and also still have a lot to learn at the same time. I can I can be in the trenches, but understand that I don't know it all. I, I never will know it all. And just to keep learning and challenging and growing and, and be uncomfortable. Um, again, mm. that, that can, both of those parts can be true at the same time as well. Yeah, we doesn't seem to be such a binary. We're so, we're such binary creatures. I don't yeah. know why we always need to, <laughs> we need to agree or disagree, right? We need to weigh in on things we have no business weighing in on. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's just and it's not it isn't a binary at all. Like you just said, it's it's and the discomfort of living in the middle, right? You know, is um is so it's such a life lesson. It's it's yeah. a beautiful thing and the ambiguity. I mean, identity is ambiguous. Uh, you know, more and more yes, we will be a minority majority nation, you know, in I think a decade or so, it depends which statistic you look at, but, um, and also gender identity is very fluid as another dimension where one in five people under the age of 35 will identify as not straight and not cisgender. Right. Um, but these are identity continuums, by the way, for those of you who sort of don't know the one-on-one, but, but there is trans identity, there's cisgender identity, but there's identities that fall along the spectrum, and it's never been a binary, actually. Right. So, so that's just one piece, an example of um, it's not black or white, literally. Um, yeah. Being multicultural, having you know, being multiracial, is going to be America. Right. Uh, and so, our ability to, you know, dial up, dial down, be super flexible, be very like check our understanding. The other thing is not to assume that one community the identity is the same. I mean, I know it sounds so obvious, but like I have to remind myself that when I I think I know one thing about this community and you know how to what kind of solidarity looks like or for LGBTQ people, then I realize like there is so much diversity within the diversity and depending on who you ask, certain people don't want to do any emotional labor with you mm -hmm. and certain people love it. Certain people say call me, ask right. me. I I spent a lot of time with people with disabilities and saying, you know, I'm really cognizant of emotional labor. I don't want to, I don't want to cause that. And and the answer I get very often from that community is, please ask. Please do not pretend that you don't see me. Right. Um, right. And and so reconciling that with with the things I've heard and been instructed around with other, it's just really fascinating. So, um, you know, as much as we learn, the much the more we learn, we don't know, and it's okay. I, I don't mean to get ever like frustrated with that. I think it's more, it's just like you said, just continuing to sort of add the layers. Um, you're you're building back the onion, if you will. Like it's just it's a really fascinating process, and all the sort of technicolor ways that we are, and how diverse each one of us is. When right. even when we can't see it, we cannot see each other's diversities. Um, if we define it more broadly than race and gender, which I do, you know, I want to, I I want to know. It's a gift to have somebody give that information to you. It is it is truly a very special moment, um, and I I love that I get to go around and and invite that, and then right. just be like shocked at my own bias at looking at somebody. And thinking I knew who they were and then having them tell me something and again deepening that trust that I have with them having been trusted with somebody's very vulnerable experience and then realizing that every single person I meet there is so much going on for them and that is just such a it's really 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 like the opportunity of a lifetime so right. <sighs> wow well Sorry. Thank you. So I know <laughs> 
We've taken it all on in the last oh, half. We have. <laughs> this is every day for me. No, <laughs> it's, really, it's intense. What, what wonderful. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, Jennifer, I will make sure in um, the video description that I include links to your book, to your podcast. Thank we you. can get to talk about the podcast um, and your website. But are there key places where you know people should go to find you? I always like to offer that up just to, to share. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes. So podcast is called The Will to Change. So please check us out. We're in year three and having a blast. Um, my website is jenniferbrownconsulting.com and we run online DEI foundations programs. So there's more information on those online uh, blended learning programs is what we, we like to use under our courses. So please consider looking into those learning programs. If you're starting on your journey and this made you very curious, I would definitely head over there. Uh, we do a community call for DEI foundation, uh, foundational learners, also practitioners, people that do this work in organizations. We do those Thursdays at noon Eastern. So you can also find that on the website. And then in social media, I'm always sharing um, stuff and other people's um, stories and research and celebrating you know, the knowledge that lives in our community. So check me out on LinkedIn and Twitter. I'm very active. I'm at Jennifer Brown on Twitter. I'm at Jennifer Brown Speaks on Instagram. So join me over there. There's a lot of places. And then buy the books, uh, especially the second one, I'd say, is a very, um, I think, apropos read for right now, How to Be an Inclusive Leader. And there's also something called the Inclusive Leader Assessment. Um, actually, if you go to inclusiveleaderassessment.com, you'll see it. And it's a really great companion to reading that second book. Um, and it gives you a score on the continuum. And then it gives you some ideas for reading and listening and things like that. So helps you kind of get oriented and take that right next step. That's excellent. Yeah, I'll be sure to include that that link in the video description as well. Because like you said, knowing where we are on the continuum, we can think we know, but you know, having that to help guide us and see where we are so that we can take the next right steps to right. on the journey is, is fantastic. So thank you so much for, for sharing that. And thank you for sharing this time. This was great. I really enjoyed this conversation. And thanks for all the learning that you've done, you know, that made it a really awesome conversation. So I appreciate that. Yeah. Well, thank you, everyone. And we will see you next time.